How great thou art. What a beautiful way to open today's presentation. Ladies and gentlemen and honored guests, wherever you might be today, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, and above all, to you all, welcome. My name is Bruce Hemmingson, and I will be your moderator for today's lecture presentation. Along with my wife, Chintana, we are privileged to be among the very few Thailand representatives of the Asian patrons of the arts in the Vatican Museum, referred to as AP, the APABM. Today's presentation will be recorded for future distribution to you all, so there is no need to take any notes if you choose not to. Today's presentation forms part of the Lost Art Masterpiece Lecture Series, with today's third presentation brought to you by the APABM, where we are and, and do enjoy the tireless support and dedication and enthusiasm of our chairman, Mr. Ben Chang, and his wife, Kim. In advance, let me express our profound appreciation to both Ben and Kim for making this wonderful event possible. So the extraordinary story of Leonardo's Last Supper. In today's third lecture of this four part series, we will be embarking upon a very thought provoking journey into the amazing history and steady decay of Leonardo da Vinci's mural painting. Possibly the most famous mural in the world, Leonardo's Last Supper is literally disappearing before our eyes. Painted in the late 15th century on a wall in the convent of Santa Maria del Grazi in Milan, Leonardo's masterpiece has suffered from his own initial unsuccessful execution technique, pollution, and a number of unsatisfactory restoration attempts over the centuries. I believe there might have been six restoration attempts, but I think Maria Cristina will elaborate on that. Using sketches by Leonardo and copies of the fresco by his contemporaries, Maria Cristina will now take us behind the scenes to identify the true hand of the master. So without further delay, allow me to welcome and introduce our most esteemed and highly knowledgeable guest presenter, Maria Cristina White de Cruz. So welcome, Maria. So let me talk a little bit about Maria's background and history. Maria Cristina White de Cruz grew up in Rome and pursued art studies in the UK and France and trained as a guide for French and English speaking pilgrims visiting the Eternal City. She later pursued postgraduate research in Renaissance history at Christchurch, Oxford. Then in 1995, she moved to Australia where she taught and lectured extensively in history of art and worked on various stained glass commissions. Maria Cristina returned to London in 2000, where she taught comparative religions while still working as a glass artist with commissions in both Cambridge and the United Arab Emirates. Please now welcome Maria Cristina to the microphone. Maria, it's all yours. Thank you, Bruce, very much for your very kind introduction and thank you all for um, coming together and I will try my very best. This is a very tall order to uh, speak about Leonardo's Last Supper, but um, hopefully uh, we will go on this adventure together. And I'm gonna do some. So um, as I was looking at the, um, the title, you know, the extraordinary story of Leonardo's Last Supper, I thought I would add survival against all odds because um, well, you'll find out why I want to call it survival. So, and I would like to thank Mr. Ben Chang, who is the president of the Asia chapter, the patrons of the Vatican Museum, and uh, continuously thanking Michael, Carl, Father Michael, who introduced me to Ben, and, um, and it's been fantastic to be able to collaborate with you. Uh, Lulu, who's been amazing. And, um, and lastly, I want to thank Claudia Tedeschi, who uh, is a colleague and friend who lives in Italy and works for the superintendency in Milan. And she arranged a very special private viewing only a couple of months ago 
of the Last Supper. So it's, it's kind of fresh in my memory, if you see what I mean. But um, before I start, I want to dedicate this talk to Duke Ascanio Sforza Cesarini. Duke Ascanio is a friend, family friend and a colleague, and uh, is an was an incredibly enlightened entrepreneur, visionary against all odds, and passionate antiquarian, and has many features in common with his um, um, ancestor, Lu Duke Ludovico Sforza, who commissioned Leonardo in the, in the first place to paint the Last Supper. And Duke um, uh, Ascanio was uh, inherited some land, which was essentially a swamp, and he did excavations and was able to restore the original port, which was built by Trajan, the Emperor Trajan and Claudius. He died less than two weeks ago, so um, it for me, it seemed like the natural thing to include him and um, thank God for this friendship and, um, and keep him present in our memory. So today I am going to go, it's, it's going to be pretty much a whistle stop uh, tour because there's a massive amount of information that we need to do. But we um, will consider um, Leonardo as an entrepreneur. He has the initiative to write a letter what he comes up with, innovations, and um, we will be uh, looking at the church of Santa Maria delle Grazie, where Ludovico Sforza uh, wanted to commission his family vault, his mausoleum, and how we ended up commissioning the Last Supper. We look at the techniques, the conservation attempts, its history, and what is the situation now. So, in 1492, the 30-year-old Leonardo drafted an application letter to the Duke of Milan. This letter put Leonardo's seemingly endless engineering talents front and center by way of a 10-point list of his abilities, while his artistic skills are referred to towards the very end, almost as a postscript. Now, this is the a copy of the original letter, which is now in Milan. And the letter reads, most illustrious Lord, having now sufficiently considered the specimens of all those who proclaim themselves skilled, contrivers of instruments of war, and that the invention and operation of the said instruments are nothing different from those in common use, I shall endeavor to explain myself to your excellency, showing your Lordship my secret, which shall be briefly noted below, and so on. At great length, Leonardo proceeds to list his ability as an architect and engineer, capable to design and construct different contraptions for the art of warfare, among other things. Only at the end of the list does he say, I can execute sculpture in marble, bronze or clay. And also I can do in painting whatever may be done. And adds, the bronze horse is to be the immortal glory and eternal honor of the prince, your father of happy memory. So this was something that Ludovico wanted to commission. And of course, of the illustrious house of Sforza. And if any of the above named things seem to be impossible or not feasible, I am most ready to make the experiment in whatever place may please your excellency, to whom I commend myself with the utmost humility, etc., etc. Well, Ludovico Sforza, born in 1452 and died in 1508, is known as Il Moro because of his um, swarthy complexion, The Duke was Duke of Milan. He was highly intelligent and an ambitious, enlightened prince. He was a generous patron of the arts, so much so that during his government, Milan experienced the full blossoming of the Renaissance, becoming the new capital of culture and learning and his court one of the most splendid in Europe. It is not surprising then that Duke Ludovico immediately saw in this letter the potential of a man with impressive engineering skills, but who was also something of a multi-gifted master of architecture, sculpture and painting. Leonardo's effort paid off, and so he left Florence to enter the service of the Duke at the court of Milan, while the young Leonardo brought with him 
all he had absorbed in Florence and learned in Verrocchio's studio, it was during his 17 year stay in Milan where he reached new heights of scientific and artistic achievement. The result was the development of his distinctive and radical style, creating a revolution in pictorial representation, starting with observation of nature, summed up in this extraordinary painting called The Virgin of the Rocks, which is now in the National Gallery in London. Now, for the next few slides, we're gonna do a whistle top tour of the key innovations by Leonardo. So you get an impression of what he actually managed to do. So his anatomical studies achieved new heights with his consummate observational skill, drawing skills, then went far beyond the skin surface. His interest in physiognomy was for Leonardo a way of registering human emotions and gestures in order to imbue drama into his work. And through scientific observation of the landscape, Leonardo developed what we call atmospheric perspective, giving the illusion of depth to his paintings, noting that hills and mountains in the distance look not just smaller, but hazier shades of blue as they recede into the landscape. The development of the pyramidal composition, however, uh, gives extraordinary stability to his compositions regardless of the complexity of his design. So you can see this, both of these paintings, this is something that he also used in the Last Supper. And finally, Leonardo developed his signature sfumato technique, both in drawing and in oil painting, using subtle gradation of tone to give form to objects and figures so that they are look as if they are emerging out of the shadows or out of a cloud of smoke. Therefore, Leonardo's own workshop in Milan was obviously a veritable hive of activity, buzzing with apprentices and students where he imparted his new style to the younger generations of artists, now referred to as the Leonardeschi. Now, back to Ludovico. He planned to build his family mausoleum at Santa Maria delle Grazie in a Dominican convent whose chapels were already used by the most important families in Milan as a place of burial and for private prayer. There, he commissioned Bramante, to ex the architect, to extend the church and create the famous dome that, which would hover over and above the Sforza tombs. Indeed, Ludovico and his young wife, Beatrice d'Este, lavished time and funds to expand and embellish many aspects of the Dominican convent. They commissioned Donato Montorfano to paint a larger than life-size crucifixion scene in the traditional fresco technique on one end of the refectory, the dining hall of the Dominican community. The crucifixion, fills the, the crucifixion scene fills the entire wall, but visitors now might miss seeing in the bottom corners of the painting two ghost-like figures, which I've highlighted in red. Um, these figures are the donors, Duke Ludovico with his eldest son to the left and Duchess Beatrice with her younger son to the right. These figures are attributed to Leonardo and unlike the rest of the clear and readable wall painting above, these have lost practically all their layer of pigment. Why is this so? The answer is in the painting technique, because Leonardo is likely to have actually added these figures afterwards. So I'm just going to very briefly tell you a little bit about the fresco technique. So the technique that was used to paint the wall picture, not the technique used to paint the figures below. So essentially, fresco is a method of painting water-based with water-based pigments on freshly applied plaster, usually on a wall. The color, the color pigments in water um, dry and set with the, with the plaster to become a more permanent part of the wall. And the image on the right is from the Leon uh, Michelangelo's Sistine ceiling. And you can see that the image, despite being painted 500 years ago, is still crisp and very, very clean because it's because the pigment has penetrated the plaster. And this uh, another example, 
the um, high resolution photo of fresco painting. And on the right, secco, fresco meaning fresh, secco meaning dry. You can see how the paint material on the surface um, actually is on top of the surface and it hasn't really penetrated. So you can see how a painting made in the technique on the right, the actual pigment would be liable to um, damage um, deterioration over the years. For these figures, unfortunately for us, in the Last Supper, Leonardo used a mixed a mixture of tempera and oil and other binding media on a dry seco surface, what today we might even call experimental mixed media on dry support. But from this sl the slide you've just seen, you may notice that the pigment um, is absolutely um, random. Now, in 1495, Ludomico, commissioned Leonardo to paint the Last Supper on the opposite wall to the crucifixion we've just seen. Now, the theme of the Last Supper is a staple subject matter for any refectory of a religious community, it goes without saying. However, no one would have expected the confluence of all of Leonardo's pictorial in innovations in one single composition, making this an extraordinary never seen sensation when it was first unveiled. We can never recognize Leonardo's power of invention by the simple means of comparing his treatment of the subject with any other which had preceded it. The Last Supper of Ghirlandaio, for example, painted only a year or two earlier, if you look at the lower register of this slide, is tame in comparison with the apostles sitting on their best behavior, uh, sitting upright, fundamentally using the standard Last Supper composition template that had been used for over a thousand years. Leonardo chose the reason why it's very different to Ghirlandaio's to represent the Last Supper in such a different way. Leonardo chose to represent the moment in John's gospel when Jesus predicted that someone at the table would betray him agitating the whole group with great sadness and vehemence. It conflates a series of mini narratives into one image. You can see where little groups, the, the apostles have been grouped in four groups of three and uh, giving the image an underlying rhythm that binds it together, everything emanating from the central figure of Christ. All are startled and form highly animated superbly arranged four subgroups of apostles flanking Christ at the center. There is life and movement everywhere. The diversity of emotions and gestures could not be greater. The pose, the figure and features of each person perfectly reflects his reaction and emotion. The rendering is true to life and strong. I cannot impress on you how absolutely radical this was. Now, we agree all art requires a leap of faith, but this one would have seemed to the people who saw it as absolutely miraculous. Through the accurate application of linear perspective, this painted room really did suggest another space where other recognizable lifelike human beings were eating and seen by the friars while they were eating in their refectory with whom this would have obviously had additional resonance. The illusion of space in the background was achieved not just with a perspectival projection of the upper room with doorways and trompe l'oeil tapestries receding in the background, but with the windows opening into a distant atmospheric landscape while framing the central figure of Christ. You recall I showed you this earlier on as one of the, his inventions. It is clear that this was a heftily contracted work between Leonardo and the Sforzas, but it seems that here Leonardo had license to push the boundaries of what had been produced before, resulting in his masterwork, something never seen before. In this composition, Leonardo included the sum total of his explorations in the human figure, portraying gestures, different emotions and human expressions in the apostle. Now, this is a detail of Judas, 
who is always interesting in Last Supper compositions for obvious re reasons. Here, not just in the way he carries the bag of silver as a symbol of his betrayal, betrayal but in the manner Peter behind him is leaning manically, maniacally across to whisper into John's ears, pushing Judas away closer to our space, his face in the shadow. He is of the scene, but separated from us. Now, the detail on the left is actually from a famous copy of The Last Supper, because in the original, we can barely see any of this. And the image on the right is a drawing by Leonardo in preparation for the figure of, of Judas. And I would like to draw your attention to the elbow, Judas's elbow, and he's knocked over the salt cellar on the table. And of course, there's an expression that, you know, if you knock the salt, it brings bad luck. But it's not that it's bad luck, it's that salt in antiquity was a very precious commodity. So it would be not a great thing to be doing that. And that's why Leonardo has, you know, the luck, the, the, the doomed position that Judas has is reflected also in the salt being knocked over onto the tablecloth. Leonardo's composition was radical in the way perspective was used to give the illusion of the upper room as a continuation of the refectory space below. It was radical in the way it was painted, unfortunately, using highly experimental and not very good techniques, and of course has caused problems if regarded for its long-term survival. But the painting was radical in terms of the way the apostles and Christ interact. It was radical in the facial, fe facial features that were pictured in the gestures, in the astonishing interactivity of all those characters. And this is why this was such a sensation. However, by 1517, we know that the Last Supper had already started to deteriorate. So this is uh, less than 20 years after it was painted. This fact was noted in many diaries and letters of the time. The corrosion of the work can be accredited to his unconventional painting technique for a work on the wall, as well as the surface itself. So two things really, the technique and the surface. Santa Maria delle Grazie sits in a low-lying low part of the city, partial to flooding and dampness. The surface on which Leonardo painted is an exterior wall and would have absorbed moisture. The painting was also exposed to steam and smoke from the convent's kitchen and from candle candles used in the refectory. Already by 1582, it was recorded that the Last Supper was in a state of total ruin. So this is less than 80 years, 80 years after it was finished. Around 1652, a door, can you believe it, was cut into the refectory wall, destroying the area in which Jesus's feet were depicted. And then, it's not over yet, in 1796, French forces under the orders of Napoleon took control of Milan and used the refectory of Santa Maria as their stables. The men of these forces would spend their free time throwing rocks, bricks, and horse manure at Leonardo's work. 1800 bought, brought a flood that would fill the refectory with two feet of water for 15 straight days. Due to the standing water, the walls absorbed moisture, leading to a thick green mold covering the entire painting. An English writer recorded in 1847, the work will never more be seen by the eye of man. The greater part is perished forever. Author Henry James later wrote that this is the saddest work of art in the world. However, a bit of cleaning, a bit of cleaning up. By the end of the 19th century, the refectory was cleaned up and was accessible to artists who were slavishly copying and freezing in time whatever image was left of the painting on the wall. So you could see these various easels and paintings that people have tried to copy. Finally, and this is tragic, the Last Supper was almost completely lost on August the 16th, 1943, at the height of World War II. On this day, 
a Royal Air Force bomb struck Santa Maria delle Grazie, destroying the roof of the refectory and demolishing other nearby spaces. Thankfully, the Last Supper had been protected by sandbags, mattresses and pillows, saving that wall from destruction. But you can see on the right that the roof had completely disappeared. However, uh, not only that, despite the walls, the, the, the walls where the two paintings were survived, these were exposed to the elements while the roof and walls were being reconstructed. Today, the Last Supper is a ghost of its former self, with only 20% of the original paint left on the wall. It is a hint of what it had originally looked like, even after Pinin Barambilla's restoration, which took 19 years, primarily removing overpaint and bad restorations that had been added over the centuries. You can see here a detail of the original painting on the right and the same detail of uh, one of the famous copies of the Last Supper that is now in Belgium. And there is also, uh, this was executed by Leonardo's pupils. So you could see the absolutely radical difference between one and the other. And here we have the images of Pinin, Br Pinin Brambilla, who was a very, very famous a uh, restorer in Italy, and she um, did lots of different things, but most famously, basically removed uh, all the dreadful restoration that was done over the years, uh, the horrible pigment that was added. And this particular um, project uh, was completed in 1999. Now, because of publishing, because of mechanical reproduction and photography, we have a sense of histories of art and what are the most important and iconic works and forget that it was only the most public of monuments that had that broad appeal. So these days we have postcards, we have photos, we have snapshots, we've got iPhones, we've got everything. But, and we have museums, but in the past, only the most public works were being seen by everybody. A lot of art was in fact produced for private spaces or for places of devotion, such as churches. And this particular painting was commissioned for the refectory of a religious community in Milan. And yet, even this image, despite it being for a private space, in its lifetime, stories spread about its revolutionary subject and the way it was painted, and it became an object of curiosity. The King of France at the time even wanted to, to take it away with him, and people wanted to see it. It is hard for us today, given the number of copies that exist, given that the influence that it has had, to really understand how radical an impact Leonardo's Last Supper had when it was first painted. Now we can only get a hint of just how beautiful it must have been. In the way we look at the Renaissance and all the art that has followed, there is no doubt that this work nevertheless continue, continues to represent a pivotal moment in the history of art. Maria Cristina, thank you for what has been a most amazing and thought-provoking presentation. I'm sure we have learned a great deal more uh, about Leonardo's Last Supper mural. I know that I certainly have. I know that we might have a number of questions, and I'll certainly lead with one in a moment, uh, from our audience regarding your talk. Um, so for the next 15 minutes, perhaps, um, if you wouldn't mind taking a few questions. No, no, I'd be very happy. I, I, I must say that, that uh, there was some technical issue with the slides going very fast, which were beyond my control and which sped me up. I was sort of really on a, on a fast track, but um, let's slow down. I'm happy to answer all the questions because I, I may well, I may have gone a bit too fast in some points. So people may want some clarifications. No, quite okay. I, I think my, my first question, so Leonardo's technique, I think at the time, um, if I understand correctly, 
Leonardo was experimenting, as, as we might be told, with different types of pigments. And that even when this painting was done, and unlike a fresco, it wasn't done in all in one go. It was, it was painted over a, a period of time. Do we know what period he was actually working on this? He um, painted this between um, uh, 1495 and 1490, uh, three years and 1498. So, um, uh, and we know from some accounts that sometimes Michelangelo, uh, uh, Leonardo's apologies, uh, would come and just look at it and look and just go up the scaffolding and do a little bit of touch up here and a touch up there. And the other thing, of course, he was using a, we can't even say that he was using a technique X because he was really using a bit of everything and uh, including oil paints, which he could, he, he used on other projects, um, famous projects. However, um, you know, for, for anybody in the audience who has actually um, painted, they will know uh, that oil paint, uh, the technique of oil paint is a very slow technique because you have to wait for the um, the glazes to dry before you apply the next layer. So Leonardo was mixing oil with um, with his pigments. And of course, it was the oil technique more so than any other technique, which allowed Leonardo to develop his sfumato technique, which is what made his figures look so three-dimensional. Uh, not just three-dimensional, but actually emerging out of some sort of atmospheric context. I, I cannot impress how much we have to unlearn what we know about images and photography and painting we need to go back to the 1400s and try and imagine that what we are used to is, is, is just didn't exist. So what, when, when this image, when this painting was unveiled, I mean, the crucifixion scene was amazing and spectacular, but it looked like a painting. Whereas Leonardo's Last Supper, when it was unveiled, it looked like, the extension of the room where real people were doing a tableau of Jesus's Last Supper. So it was sensational in every way. I've, uh, I've got a question from Linda Balin. She asked, how long did it take to rebuild the roof of the convent after the, after the World War II bombing by the RAF? That is a very good question. I don't know the exact question, but it was given priority. The bombing took place in 40, in 1943. And, um, you know, it didn't happen overnight, but obviously there was a lot of, I mean, it wasn't just the roof. I mean, there was disaster was had struck absolutely everywhere. And even the, the church uh, also had damage, roof damage. I mean, there were other monuments, for example, in uh, Padua, there was a, ch a famous chapel decorated by the Venetian artist um, Andrea Mantegna, and that was completely destroyed. So we only have black and white photographs, but at least we have we have the structure. But of course, it's 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 compounded by the um, the, the the terrible technique that was used by Leonardo which caused, which called for people to dabble with it over the centuries. And then the coup de grace was the war, but we still have something now, I guess we. Okay. Now I've got a question from William Chang, which really delves into the mind of Leonardo. So I'm not sure whether you can answer this. And, and the question is this, are there any hidden messages in Leonardo's Last Supper, as he had done with, with other murals and frescoes? And, is Mary Magdalene in there? And what is Judas holding in his right hand? So there's really three questions there. Any, any secret messages? Okay. Is, is now, Mary Magdalene there and what's Judas holding? Okay. Uh, secret messages? I, I wouldn't say secret messages. I think what Leonardo has done, he has looked at the gospel passage 
and meditated it and tried really to uh, enter into the spirit of the of the of the dramatic events of that special night uh, on on Monday Thursday, um, and it wasn't you know he realized that this special meal, you know people, you know children will be sitting upright and in the best behavior when they're sort of maybe having their Sunday lunch with their grandparents, but. You know, in the in that image we saw with the detail of the Girlandaya fresco, they were all, you know, he had represented the apostles all sitting nicely with straight backs. Whereas um, Leonardo imagines this is real people, friends together, having a wonderful time, and then suddenly Jesus drops this bombshell and says, "Hey guys, one of you is going to betray me." And there is just this incredible commotion. So Leonardo, Leonardo's really entered into that commotion and has used his passion and interest in physiognomy, in anatomy, in shade, in drama, in, um, in construction of composition to try and reflect that. Now, of course, there's been all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, conspiracy theories, uh, not just about Leonardo, about Michelangelo, about anybody, frankly. And no, there isn't. Um, there isn't that Mary Magdalene. But the figure on the left, to the left of Jesus, is John. And John, the, the apostle, is normally, is usually uh, um, acknowledged to be the youngest of all the apostles. And that is why he is the only one. Um, well, he's not the only one here, but usually he is the only one without a beard. So that is why. Um, and they, sometimes John is seen uh, with his head closer to Jesus because he says that his head was resting on his chest. However, in this case, Peter has drawn him closer to him so that he can whisper to him. But he uses this um, this technique, this, this sort of invention, so that uh, to create a pyramidal, a mini pyramidal composition, but pushing uh, Judas out of the group and pushing him towards us. Now, what is he holding in his hand? He is holding, Judas is holding the bag of money uh, with the 30 pieces of silver. Um, uh, was there another question about this particular? No, I, I, I think you covered it very well. And, and with that, I've got another question from Lindy Liu, who's really enjoyed the presentation. But she's asking, can you expand a little bit more on the technique of Leonardo using oil painting to create perspective? Was it through layering or light and shade? Um, and, and, and that question was specifically from Linda Mulvin. Thank you, Linda. Well. Um... Perspective, uh, linear perspective, is is uh, it doesn't have to be you. It doesn't have to be uh, you. Don't need oil painting to achieve linear perspective. Um, it's it's a mathematical procedure, and this was devised by Filippo Brunelleschi, the Florentine architect who designed the dome of the uh, of the Duomo and the, uh, some of the um, decorations of the baptistry in Florence. So this was sensational when it was um, developed. I mean, people had a vague idea that things changed in shape as they receded, but he actually devised the mathematical formula to calculate it. And this can be, uh, this is a matter of drawing, of planning your composition. So it doesn't really matter what technique you use. Now, regarding atmospheric perspective, uh, you can, you can uh, try and achieve it with using um, different techniques. And you will find sort of slightly poorer versions of it in earlier Renaissance paintings where obviously the landscape recedes in the distance and things look much lighter in the background. But Leonardo actually uh, takes it. He really observes it and makes notes about it and does sketches about it. And then with oil paint, 
he is able to create a wonderful effect of glaziers. Now, the problem in the case of this painting of the Last Supper is that, you know, that he used, he just mixed around. And if he wanted to create effects of glazes, he happily mixed oil with his pigments and other stuff that he was trying out. But of course, the result is that the painting started degrading within 20 years of it being completed. You know, I, I understood that the painting had started to degrade almost <laughs> shortly after he finished it. Is there any evidence to suggest that Leonardo recognized he'd really botched it up? Uh, I have not come across any reference to that. I mean, Leonardo um, has a bit of a reputation of finishing very few pieces of work. There's, um, um, there are many unfinished paintings by him and there, um, and he, for example, to come to Milan, he had to leave a, um, a commission, an unfinished commission of the Adoration of the Magi in Milan, in Florence. And then he was back in Florence, he was working in another commission and then, you know, so th there's no, uh, there is no evidence of him uh, realizing that this was botched up, but what he must have known and I wonder whether having a workshop was, you know, helpful in that, is that because of how he worked, he, um, it took him a very, very long time to complete, um, to complete his, his commissions. Now, we know we, this has took him three, three years, we, we understand, but, and we know that he would stand and look and contemplate but of course, if you're using oils, you also have to uh, allow for the medium to finish, to, to dry properly before you apply any other surface, any other layer. Okay, is there, is there any other painting that is comparable to this particular technique that Leonardo did, or did he stop this type of technique after painting The Last Supper? Well, the only comparable uh, botched up technique is when he painted the, he was asked to add in, in the, the first crucifixion scene that I saw you in the refectory, he was asked to include the pictures of the donors on either side of the, of the composition. And that has, is even, uh, even, um, it's, it's completely illegible. We know the shapes are there. But I can tell you that the Last Supper is much more legible than the two figures of the donors on the opposite wall. The answer is I uh, no, because of course the he used that technique on the on wall. And when you, uh, I wager that if he had used this technique on panel, because he was using oil, the that uh, it, it probably indicates that that is why the the oil painting on panel. Uh, or on canvas for that matter, have survived. Okay. The problem here is twofold, the technique and the surface. They were not compatible with each other. Um, I've got a question from Maria Ng. Um, what is the current state of the Last Supper? And I understand, Maria Christina, you were there very recently, so you've seen it firsthand. Is it still yes. viewable by the public? Are you allowed to go and look yes. at it? Yes. Now, um, I went, I, I, my first trip to Milan was when I was 10. I had to go and to collect an art prize with my mom. And I, she said, the big treat, we're going to go and see The Last Supper. I was 10 and I, I have a pretty good visual memory, but I can tell you that my recollection of that experience is just a blur. And the problem is that the, um, with the Last Supper, it wasn't just the deterioration of the of the paint and the bad surface of the wall, but the, over the centuries, uh, people would go and touch it up and paint it and try and make things darker or brighter, whatever. So there was a lot of interference, which was terrible, and you stop. You basically you couldn't see anything. Whereas in the last. Uh, in the last 20 years of the 20th century, we have this major conservation uh, project 
by Pinin Brambilla. And she spent most of the time removing all the garbage that had been added to the surface and consolidating the original pigment. So when you go there, uh, this is what you see. This is a fairly recent photograph, the detail that's on the screen here. And yes, you're right. I was in Milan in, um, in June this year and through this colleague who I acknowledged at the beginning of the talk, I had not just the, the privilege of, of, of seeing it fully restored, um, but also to be, uh, there were just three of us in the hall. It was, we had access during the lunch break before the tourist hordes arrived. And yes, only 20% of what was originally there has remained. It's, it's a very pale version, a pastel version of what must have been, but it, it, it still has an incredible mystique, has an extraordinary magic and appeal because this is something that over the last 500 years, uh, people have flocked to see, have tried to save, have tried to destroy, but we also have the drawings that some are many preparatory drawings for this composition. So uh, these are, um, you can be seen, they can very, very good um, photographs online. Most of them are in the Royal Library at Windsor Castle. But if you look at those drawings, you can see, you can begin to have a glimpse of the magic of the characters, of the emotions of these people, of these actors on the table with Jesus. So when I look at it now, I, yes, I know I can, there's, there's a, it's a shadow of its former self, but I also have the, um, the privilege of knowing those drawings. And of course we also uh, have, there, there are several, full-scale copies of the painting, um, both in oil. Uh, several copies were made, and one of them is now in London, which I know reasonably well, and another one is in Belgium. And these were both painted within, you know, 20 years of it being completed. Um, but this, it's not just the copies, but, but also the composition has been seminal and basically it's a watershed before and after Leonardo's Last Supper. After his Last Supper, no Last Supper representation could ever be, um, you know, like the old style. Right. I had heard, and maybe this is wrong, the, the copy that is in Belgium um, was actually painted by Leonardo's students. But along with that, it is thought perhaps that the painting of Jesus and of St. Peter in that particular painting might have actually been done by Leonardo. That is true. Um, it's the, the, that particular painting at, uh, in an abbey called Tongerlo uh, in Flanders in Belgium is a very, very interesting uh, copy. And of course it's, of all the copies, it's probably the one that is closest to uh, the original wall painting in Milan. And it, um, the theory is that this painting was, this oil painting was created by Leonardo and his, or under Leonardo's direction uh, with his students, with his pupils, to create a copy that the um, French king could take back with him to uh, France. Now, it's typical that, you know, somebody arrives, conquers a place, and the first thing you do is you want to sort of get the loot and take it back home. And it was a bit tricky to remove a wall. So he managed to, um, the story is that he requested a uh, facsimile, what should we call it? Now, um, it was, it appears that the, um, the painting in Belgium has, uh, specialists have identified various hands 
And when it was x-rayed, they uh, seem to find that the head of Christ and the head of John, rather than Peter, head of John, who is the young figure to the left, didn't have uh, extensive underdrawing, uh, which suggests that it was made, they were painted by um, Leonardo himself, but uh, we would need to, the person I would ask is Martin Kemp, who is probably the um, uh, the most um, significant uh, Leonardo specialist that's still alive. But if I next bump into him, I will ask him that, what he thinks of it. You'll have to let me know. Something I alluded to at the, the very start of the presentation, do we know how many restoration efforts were made that ended up having to be worked back to the original? Yes, there, 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 is, a, there is a list. Um, and in fact, I've got it here. Uh, well, there's an official list, uh, but um, let me just... So I've got... Um, we know that by 1517, it's already deteriorated flooding and dampness, and we know different comments about its state of ruin. We know that, uh, I mean, there are records of different attempts, but then when you're told that, you know, Napoleon's troops were throwing stones, bricks, and horse manure at the painting, you, you know, anything can happen. Um, we do have some sort of record, and the the the, the most recent conservation uh, approach by Pinin Brambilla, uh, she would have make made an absolute scientific record of everything that she found and the different layers that she found. So, to have the exact answer to your question, we would need to look at her at her report. But we know that at different stages. Um, different, you know, it, we know how badly it had deteriorated. And we also know that because of that, people had approached it and tried to recreate the image and paint over it so that images could be legible. I mean, I have found a photograph of, um, it's a, it was such a bad photo. It was a bad photo of a bad, of a bad painting. So I didn't include it in my presentation but it was taken in 1975. And uh, it was two years after I saw it as a 10 year old and it was just completely illegible. So at least now we can see something, but it's a shadow of its former self. Okay. Well, look, in the absence of further questions, um, I'd really like to thank everybody and, and particularly you, Maria <laughs> Christina for joining us today. Um, I think we've exhausted our time on questions. Um, if anything has not been able to be answered or somebody has suddenly thought of a question um, last moment, then by all means, please get back to the organisers and we'll attempt to give you some feedback at a later time. Let me at this juncture um, introduce next week's topic um, where we're going to have Mr Leonardo Mara present to us. So do please join us again on Tuesday, 18th October, at the same time for the final lecture in this four-part series, where we will have uh, Mr. Mara join us to present on the captivating topic of Napoleon's art heist in Rome and the Vatican. So it does seem to be the practice of invading armies to go and, as you pointed out, rip off other countries' art and take off with it. So Leonardo promises to be an extremely engaging speaker. So do mark this event in your calendar. And if possible, um, also take the time to invite your friends to join along with us on the day. APAVM needs your support. If you've enjoyed this lecture series and you've not already joined APAVM, why not take a moment to click the QR code on your screen and take the time to join this amazing organization. As at last, we finally emerged from the COVID-19 pandemic. I hope I never hear from it again anytime soon. Now more than ever, 
APAVM needs your involvement and direct financial support to keep many previously planned activities moving forward. Your membership with APAVM, along with your personal contribution and support, would be very appreciated and would mean a lot to everybody. So, ladies and gentlemen, until we see you again next week, um, we've come to the end. And hopefully we de do see you next Tuesday. And until that time, may the good Lord watch over you all and keep you safe. So thank you again. And that brings us to the conclusion of today's program. And again, Maria Christina, thank you so much. <laughs>